We are living in a time of change. A unique feature of the past year and a half is that it has nudged so many of us into a period of introspection and reassessment. We've asked, what makes life worth living? How can I overcome adversity in my own life and help others to do the same? In short, we've asked, how can we flourish, not just survive? But despite their importance, these questions at the heart of human flourishing are woefully neglected. To open this dialogue, we turn to luminaries in a broad range of fields from around the world to get their perspective on what flourishing means and what a flourishing world looks like. What makes the field of human flourishing different is the focus on how progress is made as much or more than what progress is achieved. For us, gender equality and food security are driven by empowerment, agency, and freedom. Justice and peace are fueled by forgiveness and reconciliation. Mental health and well being is supported by spirituality and faith. Education is oriented towards finding meaning and purpose in a changing world. And action on climate change is accompanied by the virtues of humility, wonder, and gratitude. Our call to action at the Templeton World Charity Foundation is to stress the critical importance of solving these global challenges. But the biggest opportunity lies in starting a revolution in research, practice, and policies. And we hope you'll join us on this journey into the future of human flourishing. There's something about the human soul which flourishes best when that personhood and community are held in tension and balance, and where both are present. To flourish means that one is living with one's fellow human being, that we're all in it together. The idea that you care about other people, uh, not just immediate family members, but, uh, but others who are part of your local community, the sense of belonging must be a part of flourishing. It's easy to walk past all the things that you see every day without understanding how fantastically creative human beings are and how it's exponential when we come together. Clearly, we face some existential threats. The pandemic has shown us there are no boundaries, economic boundaries, there are no national boundaries, there are no ecological boundaries. So one has to think of an integrative approach. Some of the biggest things we face require people to come together to address these big and hard questions. Human flourishing is very much about the contribution, the meaning that I can bring to a community and society. The future ecosystem of learning will integrate these things much better. Schools used to be very good to keep students inside and the rest of the world outside. The school of the future has open walls where we bring the community into the school to help young people understand the future and build aspirations for the future. We've always had this tagline here that we say, why not change the world? But, but what then does that mean? What we try to tell our students are first, think about a challenge that's larger than who you are. But some of those greatest challenges or questions are not ones that can be answered in isolation, but it requires bridging across disciplines, geographies, and generations. Direct instruction will probably become less relevant. As a teacher, you'll be more a coach, mentor, a facilitator, a designer of innovative learning environments where students can explore, where they can take risks, try out new ideas, work with other students. Social learning will become very important. Learning environments that are more agency-based. We spend so much time and energy on the how of education. We negotiate teacher salaries, we negotiate class sizes, we define exams and assessments. 
we spend actually surprisingly little time on the what. You want a great scientist, but you also want an ethical scientist. You want a policymaker, but you also want a courageous policymaker. We sprinkle values on top of the content. In the future, we need to see those values at the heart of education. If the goal of education is about helping people find meaning for themselves, for their communities, then you need to build learning environments that can support that. Science and technology and engineering are partners in a kind of flourishing. There can't be much doubt that the invention of the internet has produced an information universe which renders information more accessible now than it ever has been in human history. The internet is an empowering tool. It, it lets us do things that we could not do on, on our own. However, of late, for example, we're seeing the rapid propagation of misinformation, disinformation, propaganda, various and sundry kinds of cyber attack, phishing and fraud, and all kinds of bad things happen. So you have to understand something about the technology, understand how it works, understand what tools are available to you to uh, defend yourself against potential hazards. So that is what we might call digital literacy. And we should be teaching people early on how to accomplish and achieve that. With the arrival of social media and the reward system that was invented by these companies led to more extreme behavior, in my opinion. So, for, you know, how many likes do I get for saying something? Well, it, it, the more extreme things that you say, the more people you may attract because extremism tends to attract attention. So we need to learn a lot more about the dynamics of social networking. We need to learn from psychologists and anthropologists, sociologists, and, uh, and maybe even neurologists. To flourish in a technology-laden world, we need to come to terms with how the technologies we're using are affecting us. And one of the things we need to do is to recognize how much our technology is stealing our presence. Right, you know, that we you know, could be talking with our spouse, but now we're like checking recipes on the internet. There's a cost of being on technology that we're not thinking of. Women belong in all spaces where decisions that are relevant to their lives are being made. So if we really want to have women be empowered, we have to protect the rights of girls. protect their rights to an education, protect their rights to not be married before the age of 18. Women, especially in, in rural areas, spend 16 hours a day working in the agricultural sector to make it productive for their families and their communities. But it is clear that definitely they make much less than their male counterparts. So designing programs that address the structural challenges in access is extremely important. We have one in four women in Africa become entrepreneurs, and it's the highest proportion in, in the world. The second part of the world that is close to us is Latin America, where 17% of women become women entrepreneurs. There's a $42 billion financing gap for women entrepreneurs in Africa, and it's important to bridge that. And if they can be supported in their entrepreneurial journey, they can make such a huge difference to the economies, they can make a huge difference to poverty, to job creation, and they can transform those societies. We can't talk about flourishing mankind when there's a basic need, a need that makes you feel less than a human that is not being addressed. So ending hunger is about mankind coming through for mankind. I look at ending hunger as a basic human right. We know that inability to access the right form of nutrition reduces human capability, reduces our ability to perform. How can we flourish when a certain percent of the population we are living with is actually incapacitated from the very beginning? We must ensure inclusivity in nutrition because that's how we ensure that mankind is equal. The connection between food, agriculture, and flourishing is huge. 
Here in Africa, two-thirds lives in agriculture. For them, food is everything. It is their source of nourishment. It's their source of income. It's also about fulfilling that human spirit of feeling that you have control over your life. Today, the biggest challenge is climate change. These seeds are not necessarily adapted to, to the changing climate. So being able to give them means to cope with the failing climate in terms of how to manage what has changed in the environment and how they are supposed to cope with that. These are the challenges of today. To me, human flourishing, increasingly, it's not about humans alone. It's about how we live sustainably with the rest of nature. Industrialized countries, Europe, the United States, Japan, Korea, etc., we built our economies on fossil fuel. So our task now is to wean ourselves off as quickly as possible. Today, the UN said it is already too late to stop some of the devastating impacts of climate change. It is indisputable that human activities are causing climate change and making extreme weather events more frequent and severe. Climate change affects disproportionately much earlier, much more severely, the poorest countries, the small island states, indigenous peoples, and the poor communities in richer countries. And they are the black and brown and indigenous people in our world, so it's also a racial injustice. Within that, the gender dimension, that women have different social roles, different power, often different rights, like land rights. They uh, have to go further in drought for water or firewood uh, and put food on the table. Well, thanks to the young climate activists, we are now much more aware of the intergenerational injustice. We're not planning things at the moment that will give young people a sense they may have a future at all. We could face the extinction of a million species. We have to go further and think of the dignity and rights of those who are more than human, beyond human. And I mean not just animal and birds and fish species, but also at the rivers and the air. So we can't have human flourishing without living sustainably with nature. In order to flourish, we need to know that we are able to influence and determine the shape of the society that we live in and have some investment for our own future and the future of the next generation. As soon as I extend my identity to all, I see a more peaceful, just, sustainable, healthier and joyful world appreciating the things that we all care about together. It's the gloom that binds us. It's important for mankind and flourishing. We have, in a way, in the digital society, we have the luxury to think about human flourishing, to develop human flourishing, to develop education, to help people become the best and most beautiful versions of themselves as individuals and a society. And I think we should use that chance. That doesn't mean bad things will not happen. I see humanity, I see people getting stronger, I see people cleaning the ocean, I see people confronting problems. So I see many innovations that are less about individual achievement and more about collective achievement. The glass may not be half full, but there's something there in the glass and you work with it. I'm not an optimist, I'm a prisoner of hope.